live once again it's on with the black comic lords good evening everyone we've got a special interview edition tonight very special guest mr cody ziegler uh with me is derek harrison and how's it going how you doing, how you doing sir <laughs> hey i'm doing great hey, thanks for having me all? <laughs> all right all right so for those who don't know because you've been living under a rock or reading really crappy comics <laughs> Cody Ziegler is the guy who I call the the man. He is the Marvel man. He <laughs> is the, in my opinion, the hottest Marvel writer out there today. Um, if you want to <laughs> know anything about Spider Man, this is the guy. Uh, Cody Ziegler, for those who don't know, he's an LA based writer, director, and producer, and podcast producer. Uh, he writes for Marvel Comics, but has also written for. He has also been a writer on the She Hulk Attorney at Law television show, Futurama, Rick and Morty, Robot Chicken, Craig and Creek. By the way, I told my wife I was doing the show with you and mm -hmm. showed her your resume, and she's like, "Those are all the shows I watch. That's the guy who wrote that." <laughs> oh, like, yeah, great! You're interviewing glad, the guy who writes. Fan. She loves those shows. That's like that's like all her television <laughs> watching right there. He's also produced podcasts for Earwolf, How Stuff Works, iHeartRadio, and UCB Comedy, as well as directed videos featured on Funny or Die, Cracked, Hoo Ha Ha, and more. He's written on, for Marvel, he's written on Amazing Spider-Man, What If Miles Morales, Marvel Voices, Spider-Punk, and is now the current writer of Miles Morales' Spider-Man. And, as an aside, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this. I don't think I'm wrong. I believe uh -huh. you're the first black writer of 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 Miles Morales in an ongoing series in his ten year history. That is correct. I am the first the uh, the first one so far, but I am hoping honestly not the last. Honest, that's that's the, that's the dream is that this gets passed off to some other black folk. Hopefully, you'll, you'll you've you've shattered that uh, glass ceiling, and it'll mm. open the floodgates to to other writers to to have that opportunity. Uh, dude, I so, want nothing more. Yeah. So you know. Welcome. Um, why don't you start by telling us where you're from? Where'd you go to school? Yeah, so I'm um, I'm from North Carolina, a very small rural town, not even a town, a community of like 800 people in North Carolina. Uh, North Cackalack. And, you know, yeah, North Cackalack. I was out there. I was out there in the farms. You know, my dad did tobacco. Like that's what that's like. Just how I grew up in a trailer. Like didn't really have access to much besides, um, you know, what we could take from like the bunny ears on the TV. So like that's how I got into. Godzilla, Ultraman, comic books. Was like my dad was just into that stuff, and that he got me into it as well. And I ended up going to undergrad at Appalachian State, which I talked to uh, producer Derek about earlier. He, he had a sister that went there, and I, you know, I, pretty, I realized pretty early on that I did not want to do what I went to school for, which was like TV and radio broadcast. Like I did not care much about the news. Like I don't want to read like ninety point five, the 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 wolf. Like this is not going to bring me any type of joy. So I decided pretty early on that I was going to go to um to grad school uh, for to study film, and I went to the Savannah College of Art and Design and studied film there, and like just spent a ton of time making stuff with my friends every weekend on set making either in either on set or in the lab like the editing lab making stuff ended up getting a job like an internship but adult swim which is like my favorite like that's the reason i got into everything and i worked when i was there i was working under the these two dudes i was their assistant their director's assistant um dave willis he did he was the guy that created like aqua teen and squid billies and and was the original Space Ghost Coast to Coast writer. And the other guy was this dude named Casper Kelly, who uh, he had just finished Too Many Cooks. And I was just working for them for a show called Your Pretty Face is Going to Hell. And I just like sat with him through every single step of the production pipeline, writing the scripts, casting the scripts, uh, being on set, delivering like the drives to like the editing house and the special effects house. Like it was truly like a, a, another mini grad school for just like making comedy. 
And at the end of it, they're like, if you want to do what you want to do, which is like work and comedy, like you had to go to L.A. So like I moved to L.A., choked down some crappy, crappy jobs for a real long time and eventually found my way into uh, the She-Hulk room. And when I was there, uh, the number two in the room was this dude named Zeb Wells, who I'm assuming people here know since they read comic books. But our roles in the room were very much the two Marvel MCU nerds. And there was at one point in the room they were discussing like how does Daredevil po- how does Daredevil's powers work? And I happen to have a Daredevil comic book in my backpack, and I pulled it out the exact page where he's using his powers. And after the room got done roasting me, Zeb turned to, turned to me and was like, "Hey, you seem like one of us, so I would love to introduce you to the Spider Man offices." And like that's how I got in. Like he introduced me to Nick Lowe, who's like the head editor for the Spider Man offices, and he got me my very first first backup a pin pager in Miles Morales Spider Man number twenty five. Yeah. Um, after that, I got a, a one shot called uh, for Siege Society for that big crossover event they were doing. Uh, and they just did small works from that. Um, did some more like um, some more like tiny five page backups for Miles Morales. And then when Zeb was starting to take over Amazing Spider-Man, he had that Beyond Board run, the Beyond Corporation run. Right. And he really wanted to run that as a writer's room since like that's where we both came from. And like we also had worked together. And he wanted to get me into like Spider Man, like the, like a big like actual single like twenty page issue of Spider Man. So he brought me in for that and got me like four or five issues of that. And after that, I was this uh, uh, an editor, Danny Kazam, sent me a random message one day, like, "Hey, uh, do you want to talk on the phone?" I was like, "Yeah, I got nothing else going on." So I chatted them, and he was like, um, "We're gonna have you heard of the character Spider Punk? Do you have any interest in that?" I was like, "Yeah, of course." Like I grew up as a punk kid. I love punk music. I love metal music, and I love, obviously love spider spider folks. So, um, he brought me in board for that, and like he just gave me free reign, me and the the art the art team with Justin Mason and Jim um, Kalapitas to to just like have free reign, and like it was the most fun I ever had writing a book. Um, it was the most fun I think that they always said like drawing a book or coloring a book. It was truly like I could not have asked for, like a better writing experience. Like my first like actual run where you know your story isn't wrapped up in two issues. You have to have like an actual like long sort of long form arc and uh, after that got done um um uh, nick Lowe once again reached out with me and said hey saladin's wrapping up um um miles morales would you like one to take over i was like of course like that's the been the dream job like you can't see it here but like on that desk behind me i have ultimate spider-man miles morales is like first like first edition like his first appearance they think they took those first three issues and combined it like to one like mega 60 page book right that, that bag and boarded for 10 years, I guess 11 years at this place. And I've always had it um, next to like wherever I worked at, like my workspace. So like, uh, and now I have that next to like my Miles Morales issue number one. So it's a kind of a surreal decade long um, circle of completion come through. So like, uh, that's my long winded answer. Like that's sort of got to where I'm at. Um, so like um, a really, I really have to give a shout out to two people. One is Jessica Gao, the showrunner for She-Hulk for bringing me on to the show and giving right. me a shot. And also to Zeb Wells for giving me um, a shot uh, at writing comic books and both of them being very, very, very giving and fantastically talented people that are also been um, I've had the, the honor of calling not only mentors, but now very, very close friends. Wow, that's 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 phenomenal. That's truly phenomenal. A couple of things you mentioned. One of the things you said was that um, the first issue you did was was uh, Miles Morales 25. I think it's a mm-hmm. backup issue. Yep. What, what was the story on that issue? Was that the one? That's the one where he uh, it's a super simple story. It was my first one. So like I was so nervous, like, how do I got to I got to write? How do I write a story in 10 pages? I was sweating, so stressed out. But it's a simple setup. It's just like Miles is like on the way to to Jude's like birthday party. And he, he has like a birthday cake and he runs into like this really stupid villain named the Bumbler. The Bumbler. Yeah, yeah, that's and, the Bumbler. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I knew that's what it was. OK. Yeah. And they have a very silly fight. And then like it ends like a very cute way. And that's like that's just a simple in and out for like a, a, like a slice of life day in the Miles Morales story. Yeah, I was wondering why 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 Bumbler came back in your first. Okay. <laughs> so you, you created the Bumbler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was like, well, you know, I just wanted to. It seemed like a like such a uh, a fun, silly character. And for those who've watched She Hulk, you can tell that we're into like those dumb Z list characters. So like, uh, it was. I always wanted to create a D list character of my own. So like, I thought, what better chance now? What a better opportunity than to make one to to face Miles. We'll we'll talk about it a little bit more because because I I think there's some potential to Bumbler I want to talk to you about. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, the other thing is I wanted to talk to you about when you were younger, you were obviously in the comics. What, what were you, what were the comics that you were into? Oh, funny enough. So the, the re- the way that I got into comics is like my dad. So like I said, I'm from North Carolina. We used to, we have a pretty big comic convention every month or every year. 
in Charlotte, my dad took me one when you're, you're, like, you're getting a lot of shout outs from from people from North Carolina. Oh, am I as North Carolina in the chat? Love to see I, it. I count at least five, maybe six people in the chat. Uh, so, uh, you know, I almost North wore Carolina. my I almost wore my Panthers sweatshirt, but I didn't. Uh, so uh, uh, good to be seen. De well, Derek's, hey, a, Derek's a Carolinian, too, I believe. <laughs> yes, oh, I, yeah, I, I am. I'm in uh, I'm in Chapel Hill, actually. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm was from uh, near Winston-Salem. That's where I, I grew up. Um, oh, so nice. I, I'm sure you I'm sure you're familiar with the the Comic Con that goes on in Charlotte every every yes. year. I think it's called yes, like Heroes Con or something like that. I can't mm -hmm. remember what the, what's called, but he took me when I was like seven or eight, and we were walking around, and I remember there was this huge dude, this huge just jacked man, getting um people were paying he was, people were paying him like twenty five bucks for pictures or whatever. I was like, who is that guy? He's like, that's Lou Ferrigno. I was like, what's the Lou Ferrigno? He's like, he's the Incredible Hulk. I was like, what's the Incredible Hulk? He's like, I don't I can't answer a million questions. Let me just buy you some comic books. So like, he bought me some comics, which coincidentally oh, wow. for, for some reason they weren't even Marvel comic books. He bought me like Spawn number three and four and like some random tie in Jurassic um, Jurassic Park comic book and i for those who also know like there's no reason that an eight-year-old kid should be reading spawn like it's the most violent <laughs> hyper violent thing you possibly give uh to a child but like i remember like reading those like back to back and like i couldn't even like understand what was happening but because like i was seven so like i couldn't really like read that type of well so i was just like look at the pictures constantly yes hero con i just look at the pictures constantly and like that's just like those are the three comics that i had for like a solid decade i just had them oh, wow. constantly like i still have them um in my, in my little my little stash box and then when i was older i was like maybe 1920 i was working this um i used to deliver food for this chinese restaurant in clemens um north carolina and uh right next to it was a, a food line and right next to that was a comic book shop so when i would go out and get my my tips whatever i'd come back and i'd read I'd buy comics so like that's how i got into like the superhero stuff like the cape stuff like the first thing i ever bought was like world war hulk um I got into that. I got into like the boys because I was like, "What is this? I'll, I'll read this preacher." Um, a and little then, light reading, little light reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went from like completely opposite ends of the spectrum, like a big angry guy and like the most hyper violent thing you could ever possibly read. And then when I was in college, um, I was very, very broke. Um, and like I, 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 you know, please don't judge me, but like I just went on like Pirates Bay and just downloaded the entire Ultimate catalog, Ultimate Marvel's catalog. It's like that's how I just got into comic books proper. Like I was super poor, I so I couldn't like afford to go out and like party like anyone else. Like I would just stay in my apartment and I would read. I read literally um, Ultimate Spider-Man, Ultimate Fantastic Four, Ultimate X-Men, Ultimate Power, like the Ultimates one, two, and three. Like I read just read literally every single thing in the Ultimate Universe. The I was Ultimate like, oh, this is like the most slept on. It's great corner it, of the Marvel universe, and people don't realize that your whole MCU comes from from the ultimate. Yeah, one hundred percent. Like it's it's like reading it. Like I mean, the first time I read it, I again had never really read that much superhero stuff. So like, I was like, oh my god, it's like reading a movie. Like these yes. big super splash panels, and like they're like uh, you know the characters are like a little greedy. And like I remember, I remember you should think Captain America was so whack growing up. I was like, who cares about this jingoistic Star Spangled Banner dude? And then like reading the Ultimates, I'm like, oh, he's like kind of edgy. Like he has like yeah. PTSD, obviously, because he was in the most violent war in human history. So like it makes sense why he's like not all happy go lucky, but he still has like a little bit of grain of like um doing the right thing. And I remember, remember just finding that super interesting. And also like Ultimate Spider Man, it was just yeah, you know, no notes. Like it's one of the the fan, the most, one of the most well written, in my opinion, Spider Man's runs ever. And the fact that Bendis did it for the entire single thing is even crazier because I just can't fathom writing a hundred plus issues of something and have it and them all be solid. So right. that's how I got into like comics and everything since then has just been like me getting into like random stuff. So like it started out with um, Spawn and then sort of snowballed into like what I'm into today. Now you mentioned uh, you've you've written a bunch of television. And we talked yeah. about the shows that my wife loves that, that you've, you've written. How did your your experience writing television affect your uh, your writing of of comics? Interesting question. A good question. Um, I was sort of I want to say spoiled in TV in between TV, but it definitely made the transition easier. Not even just like getting the big stuff, but because I came from you know um, an MCU like a Marvel Studios production like it just made getting into comic books so much easier because i had that vouch like i could be vouched like oh yes that's an episode that kevin feige read and said yes i'm going to put money behind this and make it made so it just made it easier to make that transition into like writing comics um and also because the the page count is so much shorter for comic books traditionally than it is for tv like i found it i found it honestly it, it turned into it, i i always view comics as like 
a true creative outlet, which I know it sounds crazy because everything I do is sort of creative, but I was like, oh, there's like, I'm sort of my own boss. Like I have like an editor, but like, that's really it. Like there's not like a ton of different people has to go through like to get something made. So like, I found it really refreshing in that regard. Um, and and so there's an unlimited budget. You don't have to worry about, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. FX yeah. Is, is, is an issue. VFX yeah. Is an issue. Yeah. You can have, you know, you can have, you know, Thor punch the century into space through a bunch of planets and it's not going to cost $300 billion or whatever. So like, there's no like real money you have to worry about. But the thing that I've sort of bumped up uh, against when I first got into transitioning from, from TV to comics and I still sort of deal with today is that like, you know, you're writing TV and you have, 35 something pages and like you know things just flow so much differently like you know you have jen in a courtroom talking about habeas corpus or whatever so like you write all that stuff out so like when i came to, to comics i was i would write like a tv writer so i'd have just tons of dialogue because that's what i was used to and like you know you read sort of those early books particularly like um um siege society like it's hard for me to go back and read because it's just so much talking and um you know my editor was like hey you know uh, you can the, part of the beauty of comic books and sequential art is that like it truly is a two-hander between you and the artist so like you don't have you can let them do some of the heavy lifting like you can sort of lean on each other and like it's very so it's sort of like a symbiotic relationship right and like after like having those conversations it, it became a lot easier for me to write stuff like i still like write a lot but that's because i'm like it's it's fun like i'm also like you're paying for a book like right like there's like 50 percent of it should be like you should have like some stuff to read right you know it's it's also easier for me to like um I think when 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 you have like good dialogue, which I, I'm hoping my stuff is good. I hope people enjoy it. Like I enjoy it. Is that like it doesn't seem like homework? Because that's always my that's always like my uh, my 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 worst fears. Like I go back and read something, I'm like, oh god, can we like just can we just take out a couple sentences? Like that's always that's like a big hurdle getting over. But um, I think I've sort of found a good a good stride for for myself. And um, I'm always really envious of when I read. A, other writers that I really look up to, like Eve, I think is a fantastic writer, which everyone here knows too, but also like Zeb, like reading like his Hellions run, I was like, how does this guy get in so many jokes in such a small amount of time? Like he has so much funny stuff going on. And also you actually care about the characters, like there's heart and soul to it and stuff. I was like, I was just so like, I would rack my brain those first couple of issues being like, how the, how the hell do I do this? Like, how do I get to this level? Like this guy is so good. He made me love mr sinister yeah right i mean i've been reading x-men since the 80s and yeah. mr sinister has just been kind of a ambiguous vague guy he's just sinister and he does his little machinations and his little plans and stuff mm. but and he's been a threat here and there but funny sinister yeah is brilliant I loved his run on Hellions. Yeah, it, it was great because so the room would so we were on She Hulk at the same time that he was writing all those. So like I remember, like I'd see like work Zeb, like She Hulk Zeb, which is also like a very funny, hyper specific type of guy. And then like during our lunch breaks, I would just see him looking at art. I was like, "What is that?" He's like, "Oh, these are like these are like our ink pages for like comic books." I was like, "How does that work?" He was just like, I remember him just like showed me his computer. It was like, I think he was also writing like an Ant Man thing at the same time. So there's like this huge like Ant Man was fighting some giant like. 50 foot tall bug i was like this is what you do for like a side job he's like yeah dude, it's the best job on the planet so uh, i'm very glad that he's that he uh, got me into it because it truly is like one of the most um fulfilling creative outlets endeavors i've ever done like i still get whenever i get the emails for art i still get so excited every single time it comes in no matter who the character is what the book is who the artist is i'm always so so stoked to get like a new image of a comic page in it's so crazy it's so it's such a fulfilling uh feeling so take take me through the the, the timeline because mm -hmm. based on what you're saying it sounds like they've been working on she hulk for a long time because you've yeah. cranked out a lot of comics since then yeah she, so my first job was uh was craig of the creek in the summer of 2019 i worked there from like july to like september and then I got She-Hulk, and that started in like November tenth, twenty nineteen. So we worked on that um, for I guess uh, just about three years. I think Jessica started um, in September, and I think the last episode came out in around September. So she was on it for like a full three years. So like it truly was like three years between us writing the show and it actually coming out. So, so it was actually kind of a delay, probably because of the pandemic or whatever. Yeah, we originally, I think originally, I can't remember exactly, but I think we were supposed to come out whenever um, Falcon and Winter Soldier originally came out. It was supposed to be 
oh, like wow. 2021. It wasn't going to be, it wasn't a super pushback thing or a 2020 thing. It wasn't super pushback, but like, yeah, you know, COVID shut everything down and like no one knew how to shoot anything. So like, how do we do this without people getting sick? So like that sort of pushed things back. And then eventually, you know, it came out in 2022. Was it this year? It came out. Yeah. 2022. 22. So like, yeah, three years, like we, we spent, you know, you know, honestly, like, I was watching the show. I was like, oh, I forgot that we wrote that. Like, I forgot that joke. Like, I, I forgot this character even showed up because, like, some because like they send you the way that it works is that they'll also send you the finalized script like um a couple of, you know, a couple of weeks before it airs. And like, I remember like reading it, and being like, oh, I forgot that I even wrote this. Like, I don't even remember half the stuff that happened because we had written it at that point two years ago. By the time that I wrote my episode, T- talking about uh, throwaway stuff from from the She Hulk show, which I love, by the way, I'm. I'm a lawyer by trade. Mm. I love the She Hulk show. <laughs> it's like that show was 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 brilliant. I I think it's, I, I, in my opinion, many lawyers tend to be very have kind of a sardonic humor. They're very dry humor, mm-hmm. and um, you know, making fun of stupid people in stupid situations mm-hmm. is is kind of our thing. Yeah, and that's all Jen. That's all Jen Walters does, <laughs> particularly when she's breaking the fourth wall. So. Mm-hmm. It's like watching your inner your inner monologue being on screen. It's 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 brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. you had you had this throwaway line in the show, um, and the, and the writers had on the show where the Wakandan spear came up in, <laughs> in, in the episode. It was the episode that you wrote. You you wrote. Yeah. Eight. It was eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, wait, this dude just put in the Wakandan spear. You've got this nerdy guy. Holding it up, doing Wakanda. You have this brilliant line where it's like Wakanda forever. She's like, oh, I feel so uncomfortable. Because yeah. <laughs> I remember thinking the same thing. Like, no, you, 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 didn't just, you, you like spoke for black people everywhere. Seeing them do that, and it's like, no, I, I feel uncomfortable. So, uh, thank you. I mean, the the, the 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 I think the magic of the She Hulk writers room is that um, it was stacked with like four tried and true like comic book nerds which is like jessica gal the showrunner and zeb wells me and um another writer named jackie gale she was part of the writing team that wrote i think i think she did meg the stallions episode i think that's the episode they wrote maybe two or three i can't remember which what it ended up coming out as but like so you have half the room is like um (laughs) no i did not meet i did did not meet meg unfortunately (laughs) i would have loved nothing more to uh it would have been a dream come true um but yeah, so half of us like were like comic book nerds are also comedy writers, but the other half of the room was like straight up comedy writers, like sitcom writers. So like right. whenever they needed like the nerdy stuff, like what could she hulk get into? And Zed would be like, well, what about the character Porcupine? Or like I'd be like wrecking crew, like all that stuff. And then they would have the other comedy team just like do the heart like add in for the comedy value. But like, you know, a lot of that stuff is just like, you know, it's a sitcom. So like uh, I think that it also helped that, you know, the, the She Hulk comics are pretty 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 funny you know really funny actually yeah, um yeah. you know the, the burn run the slot stuff like uh, like it, it helps that like you have such a fun basis that this character who sort of in the comic books acts like a sitcom character to begin with you know like especially a thing that i think slot did that was really really fun was just like introduce her working at like the law firm and just making it a straight up sitcom in a comic book you know for her it's like you know it's it's the courtroom for like you know cheers it's the bar for for Seinfeld, I guess it's also like that diner. Like they just have like whatever that comedic engine is. Like it's such a it was such a like a brilliant move for them. So it made writing for the for the comedy side of it so much easier when you already have like this character who has the superpower of being able to break the fourth wall <laughs> and sort of get ahead of the joke. So it made it uh, it made it pretty ripe for like getting the comedy out there. And, and you know, I give you mad props for giving the most concise definition of uh, uh, the difference between a goon and a henchman. <laughs> can i be I, I, for uh i'll enter that in one second so uh, i see someone's asking like the writing sample that got me the job for she hulk um it was sort of twofold i wrote um it's actually still the writing sample that i use that i've gotten for every job that i use for every job now but it's uh i wrote like a a, a spec a comedy just an original pilot um and um obviously jessica got her hands on it and thought it was funny but the reason that the way that i got that interview got the job is that i had randomly met jessica maybe like two months before um, at like a random like crab dinner, like uh, a bunch of our comedy friends all will get uh, eat at a place called Boiling Crab and just eat way too much seafood. It's disgusting, honestly. But like <laughs> we met there, and, like we were like chatting, or whatever. And at the same time, I used to produce podcast, and um, I used to produce for this one particular show called Yo Is This Racist. And one of our hosts, um, Tawny Tawny Newsom, she had booked this Netflix show called 
uh, Space Force, so she had to go, like, go to the desert. And she's like, hey, since you're already well, like, oh, editing the show. Tom, that's the same one who's on, Tony Newsom. She's also on a Star Trek. Uh, yeah, Lower Decks. Lower Decks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah she's yeah, a great girl. Yeah, she's, she's dope. But she was like, yeah, you're already doing this. Like, do you want to just like co-host it too? I was like, yeah, sure. It was less work for me, honestly. So like I co-hosted it with uh, the other host, Andrew. And then randomly one day he was like, hey, I can't tell you what, but you have like a sample that you can give to me. Someone wants to read it. I was like, yeah, I literally just finished the sample because my manager was telling me to do it. It has mad typos, but take it. And then he took it and I heard nothing for like a month. I was like, great. I didn't get the thing. And then randomly I got a call from my manager being like, hey, Marvel wants to meet with you. I was like, why would Marvel want to meet with me? He's like, I don't know, dude, figure it out. And I walk in and I see uh, I see Jessica and then there she's like, hey, hey sorry for the smoke and mirrors. But um, I, I we had like a fun conversation a couple months ago and then I followed you on Twitter. I thought you were really funny. And they asked for your sample, and like I think you would be good for the show. Do you want to be on the show? I was like, yeah, cool, of course. So like, it, it was like uh, that. All that to say, like it was like half of like having like a good sample, but also being someone who someone wants to be around for eight hours in like a small confined room. Um, so like that's how I got it. Um, uh, but sorry, what, what were you saying, Paul? I, I, I'm sorry to, to sidetrack for that to answer that. Oh, uh, I was talking about the the, the your goons versus henchmen. Oh, <laughs> can I be honest with you? I'm so surprised. I was of all the things I thought was going to get cut from my script, I thought that was going to be a thing that wasn't going to make it in. Like I remember like writing it in like my little crappy room, at my little crappy apartment in K Town, being like, "There's no way that this self indulgent rant that's really just for me and Zeb is going to make it in there." But like, uh, I remember Gal sending me like the daily, showing me like dailies, like, "Yeah, we got <laughs> Charlie Cox is, is explaining." The difference between goons and henchmen in 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 to to to, to Jen and uh, I'm very proud of that. I'm very excited that, that made it in. I'm very excited that the um, the the conversation at the bar made it in. The um, sort of doing the uh, the the having both sides self like those are my 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 two like things I'm really fighting for. So I'm very 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 happy that they made it into the final cut. That was just one, a tremendously meta moment. Is, is <laughs> that whole conversation? Um, and then, and then there's the, the look, that final episode where where Jen is that is that even considered the fourth wall? Is that the fifth wall where she <laughs> she she breaks into the writer's room? Um, <laughs> how many of those writers were? Because I've never seen Jessica Gal. Uh, but okay. How many of those writers were were actually the actual writers? So obviously, you. I saw Zeb Wells in there. Yeah, it was three of us. It was uh, me, Zeb, and Gal were. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's me. That's me. Uh, with my little um, for a little Easter egg, that's actually a uh, uh, Black Panther pendant that I personally own, and they let me wear it in the in the show. So it was uh, me, so. me, Zeb, and and Jessica were in there. And the the weird, funny thing was that like you have all these like approximations of like the people that we actually worked with. So like um, the two, obviously the guy that was um, the guy and the woman, the woman and the man that were talking in the scene were like fake Zeb and fake Jessica. Okay. And then like all the other writers were like the fake approximation of all the other people that we worked with. It was truly one of the weirdest things walking in me like, Oh, that's um, that's fake Kara or like that's <laughs> fake Jackie. <laughs> you know, it's, it was such a surreal version of being like, Oh, because they, they kind of like, they wear the sort of the clothes that they would wear in like the real room. But like their face is like, just like 30% off. We're like, Oh, this is like a copy and paste of, of one of my friends. It was very, very funny. Hey, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Hit me. Um, so I'm just really curious. You got a chance to, to write the first major appearance of of, of Daredevil, right? Yeah. Obviously, he was in Spider Man movie, but you know, sustained time period on mm -hmm. screen for the Daredevil. How much creative license did you get versus how much structure did you have to work with in for that appearance? It's funny that you know, we had so a, a funny thing about that. I think enough, I mean the movies came out and the shows out, so I guess we can sort of say it. But originally, that was supposed to be Jin. That was going to be um, She Hulk um, as the lawyer in and no way home i think but uh it was a problem because she doesn't live in new york so like why would she be it was like, too much it, it you had it, it just raised too many questions like why would she do this like why would she be out there like daylighting for this kid um but we had a shocking amount of freedom for uh for daredevil um you know we never they never outright said whether or not it was still the same universe as the netflix movies or the netflix series but we were like it's the same guy so like maybe in this earth maybe they're earth 617 we're 616 and this one charlie goes left instead of right like that's the big differentiation but like they have sort of the similar history but you know the the, the comedy the show is a comedy um and like they have a very um comedic rapport and like the comics as well like we would always go back to i think it might have been one of the burn runs i can't remember but there's a scene where they're in like on the golden gate bridge and uh 
they're just having a conversation she she hulk and matt murdoch and like oh that's the that's what we want like we want like that sort of fun for fun feel feel to it and also we want like jen to like finally hook up with a guy who is like a nice guy and like sees her for both sides of her like she's not there for like, the she hook of it he's there for jen and like you know we sort of want her we want her to get a win also we want to see like a light-hearted daredevil because we haven't seen that because he was going through it so hard that was so great. That <laughs> like was he so was great. he was like you know he, my boy was going through it in those netflix those those netflix uh episodes so we wanted sort of a light-hearted tone to it and um also, we since we have the budget of, of Marvel, um, um, we were like, let's lean into like his more comic accurate depictions of his power, which is like very, That's very exactly acrobatic, one you know? of my questions you stole from me. Please talk about that. Yeah, you know, in the comics, I'm sure people who are here are familiar with him. Like he's like a very acrobatic character. Like they're like the top three are like him, was, like the spider people, like Miles, Peter, Gwen, Cindy, all those like Captain America and then like, you know, Daredevil. So like, you know, the sort of the, the classic way that they sort of show that is like, you know, the, the, the ghosted images of them like flipping and bound and stuff like that. So, you know, we had the budget for it. So like we really wanted to lean into it. And, you know, I, I sort of like sort of wrote that into like my action lines and stuff. I, it wasn't even super real detailed to be like Jin throws punches and then Matt dodges acrobatically, like just stuff like that. Just to be like, hey, this is what he's going to be doing. Like we really want to have him be like a, a super like a, a heightened superhuman like that's his deal like you know I, his senses I, absolutely and love stuff. That. I absolutely love that I, I thought your depiction of daredevil's uh physical abilities was more comic accurate than his own television series on the mm. on the netflix mm. but you did have one thing that you did i was wondering if that was an homage to the netflix run the one of the first times you see him fight is in a hallway oh yeah yeah Definitely, one hundred percent. Yeah, was was that an homage to? one hundred percent. It was. Okay. The, it was like literally the first joke that we all made, and Zeb would not shut up about this joke. He's like, "Think about it." Like he goes in front of a hallway, and then he's about to get ready, and then Jin comes in. Like, yes, Zeb, we've all thought of that joke. This we will, <laughs> we will put it in if you will shut up about it. So like, um, like originally there was going to be um, a much longer sequence where he's like he lands in, like he's like getting ready to do it, and like he he starts like attacking guys back to back, and then like Jin burst in before he even gets to knock one out, but. We, we decided like you want to sort of service both of those like you get like a little bit of taste of like you, you know yeah. of, of the hallway stuff and then we get to have like our little punchline to it and have Jen come in and, and stop everyone the, the other thing I really liked was the the scene with the intelligentsia now doing this the social media as we do here at black comic Lords we sometimes uh, how do I phrase this about having having Derek run my disclaimer um mm. <laughs> We sometimes run against an element that uh, takes offense to our very existence. Oh, yeah. If, if you get what I mean. So um, it, it seemed to me that the, the whole scene with the intelligentsia was like a commentary on toxic fanboys or mm. toxic fan fandom, you know? Mm -hmm. is, is that how you wrote because that's how i interpret it is, is that what i mean they're all sort of like they, they sort of share the same thing um oh uh martin uh me and zeb only got asked because we just happened to be on the east coast at the exact same time like they shot it in atlanta and we just happened to both be there so gets was like do you want to come like of course um but to your question um it was you know it, it, they they sort of all branch out from the same thing like a lot of the conversation in the room um between the writers, particularly like, I mean, there are only two men in the room, which me and Zeb, everyone else were, 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 were women, particularly like actually black women, which was just rare to be in. So it was nice to be around a bunch of like black women. It was great. Um, is that, you know, what's the scariest thing is like just men in general, like men are a very, very, we're a very, very scary thing. Um, particularly when like we're anonymous, which is what is, I think, I think um, the big Apple hack had happened a couple of years before. Like, it's terrifying. Like imagine like, you're like an impenetrable person has super unbreakable skin. You can lift a, a million tons, but like still like rampant toxic masculinity can bring you down. And like, what would be more frightening than would be like this idea of like the perfect woman. She's like super strong, blah, 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 blah. Like a lot of insecure dudes would probably take that the wrong way. So like, you know, a lot of these, like we just like look on like what would be scary, which would like Reddit, 4chan, um, any of those sites where like they actively like stalk people, which like swatting all that stuff. And like, we were like, yeah, that should be like the enemy because one, uh, like, she looks like the show was never going to be um, her punching Thanos. Like, it was never going to be like a, a punchy, punchy show. Like, that's why there's only really one action episode in the whole thing, which is um, episode eight. Um, 
because like that's one that's not what the shit that we wanted to make also like we're comedic we want to do comedy first um but like there's also like a very real lingering thread and sort of one of the sort of weird or not weird one of the interesting side effects is that like because this type of reaction is something that you've heard for so long and it's the exact same reaction for every single thing whether it's ray getting a lightsaber or it's i don't know it's shira being created whatever like the, this this exact same talking point so you should have had this um this unique thing where like everything that we said at that point three years ago was the exact same thing that they said when the show actually came out um which was like just very fun to to watch along with 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 the with the other creators of the show and the writers and stuff because you know we were calling like you really it was really in the room you like you just say the most like um baseline like first thought that you said they would probably say this and then you go to the actual like, comments for youtube and it's the exact same thing that you pitched like three years ago so like it sort of made it a lot easier to like sort of skirt around those things because then you can see what the actual real criticism is which is like that's honestly honestly how much more most more useful than like hate reviewing like the way that um you know miss marvel uh well, what to me one of my absolute favorite shows it had like an absolutely abysmal audience score on Rotten Tomatoes just because people review bombed it when to me it's one of the most charming TV shows I've ever seen like um, for me like watching I'm like oh this is what Peter Parker should be like this is like this is what captures the image of like an awkward high school kid and yeah. just because dudes were mad that like a, a Pakistani Muslim girl and her family got a TV show they just couldn't handle that so like uh, that was sort of like a, a side effect of that and also there were some fun things that we did where like we actually took like real comments that were left on like the the instagram post when it was announced and put that into the show and it made it really fun uh just be like yeah like this you, you're so these these type of comments are so predictable that become sort of useless so i think it becomes very easy for people to ignore them and see like what people if you're like oh this episode i wish it was longer or whatever like it makes those type of like actual real criticisms come through a lot easier so as almost it almost becomes like a um a way to just filter out like the sort of like noise that no one really cares about which made it uh which I thought was really fun and really, really interesting to watch what happened in real time. Rob's comics has a great question. <laughs> Madison became a <laughs> runaway star on this show. So much so that that there's a lot of MCU speculation as to whether or not she'll be back in, in, in throughout the rest of the MCU. She like she'll be like the new Stan Lee. She'll <laughs> pop up in an episode and say, This is M Madison, but Madison? with a Y, but not where you <laughs> expect it to be. Or whatever. Uh, that's fine. So I got to give a shout out to two people. One, the writer for that episode, Melissa Hunter, is the one who pitched Madison in the room, um, and she's also an actress in her own right. So like, she's the one who used to like. I think the first day that she pitched, like, what if we had like this like drunk party girl? Her name's Madison, but it's with an I instead of a Y, but not what you think. And like, she did the whole thing. Like, she pitched that in the room. We're like, that's so funny. You have to write that episode. So like, she wrote it, and then um, Patty Guggenheim, Guggenheim, who plays uh, Madison, absolutely killed it. She's a fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fantastic person, super, super funny. Everybody um, knows the Madison. Everybody knows yeah, the Madison. It's one of those things where also like we wish we obviously had written the episode before we cast people. So like I think Gal has said plenty of times that like if we knew that that Patty was gonna be in there uh, was gonna bring this character, we would have written Madison into more stuff because she was such a fun character and like we want to see Madison in more things. Honestly, like I would just like to watch Madison and Wongers on like a cruise, like like a, a, a little cruise ship for a week. That'd be super funny. Like I love I, everything. I about need that you anime. to pitch that. I need you to pitch that to Marvel. <laughs> Marvel's Marvel's look, Marvel's now doing these uh what they it call shorts. Them now, the the special presentations. Right? Yeah, yeah. Which can be like a one episode type thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Madison and Wong I love what you just said. Go on a cruise and hilarity ensues. Yeah, that's all you need because she's such a. They have such a fun dynamic, and Melissa did such a truly fantastic job writing that episode. Like that was actually the first episode we got. Um, like we actually had written outside of like the pilot, and uh, it was truly like one of the most fun days we ever had. Just like reading through this insanity that that um, that she had written. Uh, Kevin Feige, if you ever watch this, which you never will, uh, <laughs> uh, my boy Cody has a pitch for you. It's gonna be a hit. <laughs> let him run with it. Rob, Rob's not gonna let it go. Now I'm gonna tell you, Rob's a huge She-Hulk fan, right? Oh, does he? Uh, yeah. No, I don't think it was. Books no, and the not, show. <laughs> at, when we at the time of writing, it was not Mephisto. It was just a, a regular demon that we thought would be funny for for her to to say she interacted with. <laughs> but you never know. It's a living universe. Maybe they retcon it. You oh. know. Yeah. All right. So we're we're gonna take a quick break. 
and then we're going to get into the comics. We're going to talk about uh, just just some of the comics you've written so far, but we're going to really going to get into to, to Miles because I'm really excited yep. about Miles. Let's do it. Oh, I was supposed to I was supposed to give Derek a thirty second <laughs> heads up. Well, that you can we, we can fill the time. Commercial. Yeah, we're all good. So I'm fill we're the good. Time by we're talking good. Slowly. Are we good? Yeah, we're right, good. Right, Here we go. All right, roll the tape. What comic announcement are you most hyped about? Got it. I am most hyped about Silver Surfer Ghostlight number one coming out February 2023, starring uh, Albie Harper, who is becoming one of Marvel's newest black superheroes. Gonna be dope. What about you? I can't. First of all, I just gotta say, Silver Surfer is my absolute favorite as yeah. a little kid. So you know, I am right yeah. there with you. Oh yeah, and I it's like based wait. on like an old Stan Lee story. Look, I'm not gonna spoil stuff. They gotta go to Marvel.com, check out the press release. But yeah, yeah. you know, we'll look. talk afterwards. Just me and you for love for all that. I know Silver things. Surfer. I know okay. some all right. Marvel announced a new Silver Surfer limited series that has special meaning for the Black Comic Lords community. The series is Silver Surfer, Ghostlight. Ghostlight is written by fellow Black comic lord and Eisner Award winner John Jennings, with art from Bitch Planet and Black Manta artist Valentine Delandro. The story follows a girl named Tony Brooks who moves to a strange new town where nothing is quite what it seems, but whatever's going on is so out of this world that it actually attracts the attention of one-time Herald of Galactus, the Silver Surfer, to investigate. What mystery did Tony and her family unravel that would call upon the sentinel of the spaceways, the Silver Surfer? And just who or what is Ghostlight? The answer to the question of who or what is Ghostlight can be found in another question, as peaked by the rest of the solicitation text, which promises the limited series will introduce a new Marvel superhero 54 years in the making. What happened 54 years ago can be found in Silver Surfer number 5, which contained the storyline and who shall mourn for him, in which a character named Al B. Harper sacrifices himself to save the world. In Silver Surfer Ghostlight, Harper will return as a hero named Ghostlight with nano cloud powers. A 2021 post in the Black Comic Lords Facebook group covered Al Harper's brief story, which takes place in Silver Surfer number 5 from January 1969. In this story, Al Harper rescued and helped the Silver Surfer who had fallen to Earth. Al built the Silver Surfer a complex device to penetrate the galactic barrier. He then sacrificed himself to disarm a bomb made by the stranger which would have destroyed the world. For all these deeds, Al gained the Silver Surfer's respect, so much so that the Surfer marked his grave with an eternal flame. Ultimately, it was Al's sacrifice that gave the Silver Surfer hope and respect for humanity. Silver Surfer number five is a historically significant comic book issue. Marvel Comics' New York Comic Con announcement means that Al B. Harper will be one of the earliest appearing African-American characters in Marvel history to eventually become a superhero. This book also played a major role in the genesis of the popular fantasy series ElfQuest, whose creator, Wendy Fletcher, had a letter published in this issue. Richard Penny chanced upon Wendy's letter and then reached out to her in hopes of meeting her. From that, they eventually married and co-created ElfQuest. If you don't already own Silver Surfer number five, you should pick it up quickly, as this book may become more pricey in the very near future. Also, be sure to add Silver Surfer Ghostlight to your pull list. Buy the comics, read the comics. We'll see you at your local comic stores. If you like this video, please subscribe to and share our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. Peace. All right. Hey, um, here we go. Get the screen back. You'll have to unmute yourselves, Paul and Cody. Apologies about that. All right. Can you hear me? Test, test, test. There we are. We back up. Microphone check. One, two. What is this? All right. So it's the comic book assassin with the roughneck business. So 
I, I, we're going to get into comics now um, because we're the Black Comic Lords and that's what we do. Uh, I had a question for you. Do you do any, as a writer, do you do any research to help you find the voices of a particular character? Um, I'd say like not like hardcore research. Usually, I'll just like read the comics if I haven't read them already. Um, but I usually I, I'll say another benefit of um coming from television is that like part of the part of, sort of the unspoken um talent tree is needed is needing need is being the having the ability to write in a voice someone's voice that's already pre-established because you're usually coming into shows where you're writing for like season two, three, four, and future almost case eight and nine or whatever or whatever season it is. Um, so you're sort of used to like you from the skill sets like being able to write in someone's voice like that that's that that made things a lot easier coming in um so i came in i usually come in and like i write i usually put my voice first but like i mix it with like people people are used to reading so it's not too off-putting um but i think also people have a pretty good sense when it comes to these things that like there's so many different versions of like comic books there's like you have tv you have video games you have cartoons you have other like multi-universe version of characters so like you sort of have like a lot of a lot of leeway when it comes to like establishing a voice but like that's usually that's usually my process is like i'll i'll come in and like i'll try to sprinkle in a little bit of myself um but hopefully not too much where it becomes like alien or off-putting for, for for previous readers one of the first things i saw you write was uh marvel voices mm -hmm. um histo history making book um anthology series now the thing with an anthology series is you assume that there's going to be uh, several stories done by various creators of which it, which it did. Mm -hmm. But as I'm, I'm going through Marvel voices, I keep seeing this name, Cody Ziggler wrote this <laughs> Cody Ziggler. There's like 10 stories in the book and like six of them were done by you. Like, who, who the hell is Cody Ziggler? <laughs> I, was, I think I, I think that was the first thing I saw you you write in comics is Cody. I was like, Cody, Cody why is this guy all over this book? <laughs> well, uh, it comes from two places, um, and coincidentally, Austin, one of the characters that I would love to write for, it was featured in that book. I basically half the characters that I picked are characters I've always wanted to write for. Um, that's, that's Blue Marvel. Like, I love I love that character. I'm gonna ask you a question about that next, but go ahead. Oh yeah, I got you. So like, there, I I also have heard that from many friends about like, man, your name pops up a lot in this book. What's the deal with that? And it came about because they asked me to write for us. Like, of course, uh, they're like six pages. Like, great, I can knock out a, a six page short like nothing. And they're like, actually, we want you to be the sort of wraparound material. So like, there are six literally one pages for individual characters. Um, so like it, 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 it's honestly gonna look like you contributed much more than you actually did, but like just giving you a heads up what to expect. So like that's why my name appears in so much of it because uh, I thought I was gonna write just like one six page short, but it actually became like sort of interstitials as like a palate cleanser in between the sober, sort of a uh, larger larger narratives in right. it. So the next the next one I wanted to talk to you about because you mentioned Blue Marvel. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll circle back to that. Uh, the, the most recent other book that you wrote was uh, What If Miles Morales, mm -hmm. right? Um, you did issues one and five. Is that correct? Yes, correct. Yeah. All right. So of the five series, I read the series. I collected mm -hmm. the series. Of the five series, number one was my favorite. And I'm not oh, just saying you. that because you're here. Um, if you, anyone has seen any of my prior reviews on it, will know that I said Cody Ziggler <laughs> did the best one. Who the hell is Cody Ziegler? Again, so that's why that's why we had to bring on the show because your mm -hmm. name is popping up on all the stuff I'm reading and I'm buying. I'm spending a lot of money on the stuff that you're doing, and mm -hmm. you're forcing me to buy these books because they're good. <laughs> so we had to bring you on the show. I appreciate it. So, so I, I love this book. I love this book. I had some trepidation, honestly, mm -hmm. about the concept of you know, um, you know, having a a black established black character take on the mantles of all these white characters. But it didn't come across that way when you wrote it. It, it was like, mm. and the fact that you had so many black characters in this book, I mean, this is a mm. black, black book. I mean, yeah. in terms of, I mean, you had like Nick Fury, mm -hmm. you know, you've got Starling, you've got Miles. Mm -hmm. I, I really enjoyed the book. I mean, and, oh, and, and, and as a, as a Elseworlds type of book, you know, a, yeah. a parallel universe, it was, it was really, really well done. Um, 
And for the most part, the, the series itself was, was really well done. I'm not going to get into it because I know you probably don't want to talk about it, but the issue four obviously had some controversy. Mm-hmm. Um, but what, what, what I thought was helpful, um, your issue five kind of helped seal off or cap off the series. Mm-hmm. And you brought in my boy, Blue Marvel. <laughs> yeah. That came out of nowhere. Yeah. Like literally nowhere. Um, <laughs> I don't want to spoil it for anybody who hasn't read the book, but the way that you did it too was 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 unpredictable. <laughs> and, and it was dope. So, you know, my hat's off to you on that. Oh, man. thank you. Yeah, I mean, that was a really fun... Uh, actually, for our, uh, when I was talking about my story, I forgot to mention even those. I forgot about those because uh, I was writing all those at the exact same time. I was writing like this and like Spider-Punk and I think even Miles at the same time, like and writing like TV. So like my brain was honestly a little bit mush for the beginning of, of 2022. But you, you, um, need to get, you need to get some advice from, from, from Rodney Barnes on how to do yeah, that. Yeah, truly. Cause, yeah. Cause I don't think he sleeps. Yeah. Uh, but like, so that came about, they asked me to do it. And I was like, man, I got to write five of these things. I'm like, I don't even know where to begin. So like, I actually wrote the first one, not knowing that other writers were going to be a part of it. And then they're like, actually, you don't have to write the first and last one. I was like, oh, thank God. I ain't got to like break this whole thing. Um, so like I wrote mine not knowing that the other ones were going to be like different, um, not really knowing what the uh, they're all going to be interconnected. So like I wrote mine with that cliffhanger being like, oh, yeah, we want to they're going to come back or whatever. And then as the sort of ep- issues, I almost said episodes, as the issues sort of coming in, I was like, oh, maybe I could just like the editor was like, can you like do you want to like seed this stuff to have these other characters in case you want to use them? I was like, yeah, sure. Of course. So like. The only notes that I really ever gave was like, can you just like make sure that like maybe a portal opens and someone says you gotta join the fight or whatever? Like that was really sort of <laughs> it. Because um, another thing that people don't maybe know maybe wouldn't know about comics is that like these things aren't like really written sequentially. They're all sort of written at the exact same time. So like, but I'm writing like issue one and five sort of in the same time span. And um, so like you know I I think John Ridley wrote number two or three i think i can't remember but like by the time that that came in you know there was already sort of written like i didn't really have a script like sort of based off i just know that he was going to have miles be wolverine and that there was going to be a a, a thor miles and there was going to be a hulk miles but like the scripts weren't actually done at the same time so like i didn't even i really just knew what they looked like i didn't know how they acted so like it was kind of you were speaking about voices earlier so like a lot of it was like man i hope that they wrote like this because i have no idea how his miles wolverine sounded i'm hoping i'm guessing he said bub at some point and i'm guessing that hulk miles said miles smash but like i'm i'm i'm, I'm holding on for dear life hoping that the characters talk like that so um that was uh, that was part of the fun of it and also like i wanted to write like my own like little mini avengers movie with like just black characters and right like, right that that's how i came across to do that. That's exactly how it came across. I'm like, he, this dude just did like a little men, mini end game thing. Like, <laughs> it's like one of those things that as a writer you appreciate, especially as you're coming from television, because like I, I, I would love to do, I, I can imagine if I'm you, I'm like, if I, I would love to write my own end game, but you know, the budget on that would be <laughs> phenomenal. I could just put it in the yeah. comic. You know, I love Austin Crafton's qu- question here. Is there any Marvel character you think needs an attitude adjustment of some sort? Um, I mean, they do this back and forth because he, he's been around for so long. But like, you know, I I think it's always nice to see like Happy Wolverine. Like, you always want to give him a hug. Like, he's always like so perpetually grumpy sometimes that it's always fun to like see the flip side of that. Like, I like to see like an actual like even if it's only like a five issue run of like Happy Wolverine would just be a, a fun. I think it'd be a fun, interesting thing to see. Like, he, he's so I mean, he's every he's so many bad things have happened to him that like it would be just nice to see him get a W for like a little bit. You know, just to bask in the sunlight for a little bit. Frustrated fan show also has a question. Says, was the what if premise for Miles due to them wanting to focus on the fact that Miles has an undefined power to manipulate the multiverse? Um, if they did, they did not tell that to me. I can be honest. Like, that's honestly way more information than any editor has ever given me about anything. They're like, hey, we have a book coming out. Do you want to write it? And I'm like, yeah, I love Miles, so I'll do it. Um, uh, no, I wish that that much thought was put into it, other than like, we want to get some people to write some 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 cool miles books hey derek are we, are we good on time do we need another commercial or because i'm next i want to get into miles oh it's up to you however you want to do it we're good ah, let's just let's just keep going let's just keep okay. going yeah so let's 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 talk about it let's talk about miles morales uh spider-man um 
you, you, you just you just dropped your, your second issue came out what was it last mm-hmm. week it was last week right yeah last wednesday yeah um what i loved about this issue let's um uh, first of all the cover on this one i think it's torin clark on the right right mm-hmm. yeah that cover is just that's a work of art it's great yeah it's great that's 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 a work of art one of the things that I'm a big proponent of. One of the things that that I really am a champion of is is seeing black super love. Meaning, yeah. you have two black super powered characters in a in a in a relationship that's in an ongoing series because yeah, it doesn't exist. It doesn't it doesn't happen. Like you'll see them mm-hmm. here and there. You'll see Monica Rambeau and, and and Blue Marvel here, and you'll see Sam Wilson and, and Misty Knight over here. And mm-hmm. I think both of those relationships are, are kind of questionable right now. Black Panther and Storm, I'm not going to talk about that at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, you Do you realize that you have literally the only ongoing Black super love story in Marvel Comics right now, in an ongoing series? I did not know that, but you know, I, I, I always say this every single time that anyone brings it up, is that uh, uh, Saladin Amid did such a fantastic job with his run, particularly with yeah. like really really honing in and like focusing on like strong black women in miles's life like yeah i was lucky enough to work with with saladin on the beyond board and like the guy just like he's just got it like he just knows it so well um to the fact where i was like how does he is this this a black guy before i met him i was like oh wait how does he like how did he hone in on this stuff um but like part of that sort of getting that mantle pass is that like i also wanted to keep that going on like um i've said it plenty of times when anyone ever asked me like how i sort of came out with the idea for the series is that like you know i think Miles has a very he has a strong black woman in like I think two of the three pillars of his life, which is like love interest and like superhero stuff. Um, his paternal with his with, with Rio, but he was sort of for me. I thought he was lacking one like the superhero like mentoring aspect of it all. Right. And I so that's why where I wanted to bring in um, Misty Knight because like I love that character. I think she's really fun. Um, I briefly, very 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 briefly, got to write her for um, one of my amazing Spider Man issues. And I was like, I would love to see that dynamic with another spider-man one that was like a little bit that probably could take some more learning could use some more learning because you know miles is perpetually like a teenage kid in comics because comic you know comic books don't age so like that's really really sort of where it came from um oh speaking of age wish out ill what's your idea of the age i always say like mid-teens like 16 17 like maybe not quite 18 or if he's about to have turn 18 it's going to happen at some point a couple months from now but like I think a good age for Miles is like 17. Like that seems about right for like what I think, um, you know, someone reading this should should come with a mindset of um, another sort of an interesting thing when like writing comic books that like they have to sort of, you want them to like sort of satiate a bunch of different people, like your four quadrants for those who like stuff's care about movie terms, but like they got to satisfy people that are older, like, you know, people like our age, they have to satisfy people like their twenties, but also they have to satisfy like for me, which is the intended readers, like, people in their teens are like like they need, need like sort of learn a morality from like what they're reading like you know a lot of these all of these stories are based on myths and morality it's like you know that's why they usually they're so like on the nose or like just so in your face like hey you're a kid when you're like 15 or 16 like you have all those hormones raging through you like you have no idea how to process anything you're just like a walking live nerve walking through a school with 400 other live wire nerves and you're just like trying to process like how do I go be a person? How do I find, how do I set my moral compass to find just like that North? And like, that's where a lot of that comes from when it comes to miles is that like, I definitely remember going through it in high school. I'm sure many of the people here in this chat can do the same thing that like, you know, you, the idea for me is like a, someone that age reads this and be like, Oh, okay. Like I can see myself even now more in miles and like maybe, maybe that little sort of spider sense in me saying like, this doesn't feel right that he's doing that. Maybe that's the lesson I'll take away. I won't do that. Like I won't alienate my friends or shut out people uh, around me uh, or whatever the, the lesson is. But like, yeah, I always told miles of like 17 and like Peter's done like such a fantastic job of like helping miles and, and rearing him across, I guess, both universes um, for passing the mantle in the ultimate universe. And as he's coming over to six, one six is that like, I really want to see like a black superhero and like uh, uh, Marvel's like, yeah, I totally do that. I mean, 
my original pitch was so much crazier. It was like, all right, we're going to get every single black street level character. He's going to be hanging out with Blade. He's going to be hanging out with Luke Cage. He's going to be hanging out with Misty Knight. He's going to be hanging out with like the dude on the roller skates. And they're like, all right, you got to pick, just pick one. And then if you want to build from that, like you just, you just, you get, you can't have a book. So, like, so, so, so it's not a no. It's not a no. It's <laughs> yeah, just yeah, spread yeah. it out. Yeah, yeah. I can't just start off the book with him and like five other people in every single panel. Like, okay, you, totally, like you have totally. to build to that, you know? Bro, you, you shouldn't have said that because. <laughs> The black comic lords are obviously going to ask you for that. So we're going to ask <laughs> that over the course of this run. How, how long is this run going to be? Is there a lo- time? I have, I've, I was given 12 issues, but you know, if it does well, they're like, they're like, you, you should, you can start thinking of year two and three if, if it goes well, which I, I think is going well. But um, I have plotted out 12 issues. Um, and then I have some like pie in the sky stuff that I want to do for years two and three if I, right. if I got them. So, so, so let me talk to the fans for a second, Tony. Give, give, give me a sec. So, mm-hmm. listen, my peoples, my peoples, <laughs> this, this, I'm just talking to you, okay? Listen to what he just said. You've got this brother right here who's writing one of the most, the hottest books Marvel has on the shelves, right? Mm-hmm. He just said, you heard him say it, my original pitch was to have all of these black superheroes, street level heroes in this book. Marvel didn't mm-hmm. say no. <laughs> he said, just let it out a bit. Yeah, calm he's down. Got, he's got 12 issues. <laughs> and if you wanted to be able to get them all in there, you got to buy the book. FOC, right? three so letters. I'm, I'm, I'm going to need you guys to go put your pre orders in, order one copy of every cover, because you know you cover fiends are out there, and help my man sell some books. And, and, and I think Cody's saying, he didn't, he didn't say he's going to do it. But I think we can try and encourage him it's and beg him to go ahead and put these characters in there. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> Don't complain on a Black Comic Lord site. You're not getting your characters. The man is right there. He said... It's up to would, you. Sell I would book. love nothing more than to write this forever and have him. Like I don't, I can't, I can't get into it. But like, I would love nothing more from the that to happen. Um. Uh. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. This just happened to catch my eye in the in the chat. Um. Did you enjoy writing the new villain um, for Miles Rabble? And the answer is yes, I very much did um, enjoy writing her. Um, anytime that I write a new character, um, it, I usually try to base it off a friend just to get that one. I think it's fun to do that. But also uh, I try to get um, groups that aren't necessarily always represented in comics to get representation in comics. Um, for those who have read the comic, um, who read the first issue, um, um, his teacher, him and Genki's teacher, Mr. Akpolo is based off my friend Adri Ajine Akpolo. I was like, you know, I can't think of like, just to be like, hey, there's going to be a Nigerian person in this comic, just in case there's no, you can't deny it. Like, here's like a Nigerian cat in this comic book. Um, Agent Gal, obviously based off Jessica, my friend Jessica Gal from She Hulk. Um, I was going to ask you that. Yeah, yeah. I was like, it'd be fun. It'd be so funny to like make you like a, an evil cop, right? She's like, yeah, do it, loser. And then I did. So, jokes, <laughs> joke, who's laughing now, Jessica? Uh, but that, but like, you know, um, rabble, uh, you know, uh, I was like, I want to get this type of person represented in comics that uh, I think isn't traditionally there. And um, uh, the, the, the idea is that, like, you know, I write this character and then become like another fabric of the Marvel universe, and then someone from that actual background gets to take it and run with it. Um, that's always sort of the, the 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 ideation that I always have. Like, that's always like the the end goal, right? The dream for me is like, oh, introduce this uh, this particular character. I introduce um, Raneem who is you'll find out more about her background but like this character uh and then someone from that background gets to take it and run with it and hopefully flesh out world, their world more and add some more stuff to it but like i have a lot of fun writing Raneem. um as more issues come out you'll sort of see her point of view and like i'm sure it's a point of view that many people have when it comes to like education in 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 this in this country and like sort of how the class system works and all that stuff without spoiling too much of it okay so so, so guys again if you want Hypno Hustler, <laughs> if you want Rocket Racer, <laughs> right? You got to buy the book. Pre-order, buy the book. <laughs> Don't come complaining and bitching to us that you ain't got no black characters in these books. Your man's right there. He's waiting. He's got a pen. Let him do his thing. You got to buy the book. All right. I, I, I did my piece. I I, I try to plug. I mm. try to plug for you. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. So um, I love this 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 mentor mentee relationship mm. you've established between Miles and Misty. Um, Derek, pull pull up that slide. Oh that, yes, you will see more Judge in the comics. By the way, yes. To, 
to see Cole who asked that. Yeah. If they're if the answer is like they're black and brown they in their comics and you won't see more of them, the answer is yes, they're probably gonna pop up at some point. Like just prepare for yourself for that. This um this exchange between Miles and Misty, I mean, I just I, I kind of felt that because mm. when, when Miles first sees Misty, he's like, Oh crap, another black superhero. We mm-hmm. should team up. <laughs> You know, like, <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't have a good poker face. He just goes right, right into it, right? right. He, he, I mean, he, 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 that's what I said. You really have his voice. Like, if I was a seventeen-year-old black superhero from Brooklyn, I'm from Brooklyn myself. Yeah, I can imagine myself. Oh, oh, snap! Another black superhero. Let's let's let's, let's team up. Yeah, you know, yeah, like that's what you would think a kid would say. Yeah, yeah. And she's imagine like, playing if, the like, cool, like, imagine if like Michael Jordan just imagine like you're like mid '90s. Michael Jordan walks into your right. The place you're like, hey, what's good? It's like, yo, you're Michael Jordan, you're MJ. Like, let's let's what's good? Let's let's team up. Like, that's that's how he views these people, you know? Right, right, right. And then she's playing it cool, and she's telling him, dude, you gotta you gotta kind of chill. I mean, you're yeah, kinda, you're <laughs> all over the place. Yeah. And Miss tonight, she's been all over the place. She's she's fought alongside gods, literally. Yeah, yeah. Um, so she's she's mad chill. Um, the line that she has about that really shook me was one. She's like, you know, as a black superhero. We don't have the luxury of just shooting from the hip mm. when we go into these situations. Yeah. Um, I just thought that that was she was speaking on on a number of levels because mm-hmm. when you when you think of it, the, the margin of error for a black superhero has got to be really, really small. Like yeah. if they screw up, it, it becomes yeah, yeah. 10 times worse. But that's but that's like a larger issue of us as a people. Right. Like mm-hmm. it's. Especially as Miles as as a young black man, his margin of of error for screwing up is is so infinitesimally small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is is that kind of the 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 what you're, the message you're trying to? Yeah, I mean that's there? very. Much, I mean I'm sure most, if not all of us, have had that conversation with with our parents. We're like, right, they, the they always give you that conversation. Yeah, they give you the talk, and like that's a conversation I had with both of my parents. Um, my for a bit of time, my mom worked in law enforcement, and she was like, yo. I'm not gonna be doing this much longer because I hate this job, but like I have to provide for my family. But I'm just letting you know, I was like, this is what how they view us. And um, I think there's also a reason why she also that's probably a reason why she also stopped working in law enforcement. But like everyone gets that sort of conversation, right? And like that's very much um Misty having that moment for for Miles. And again, like I said, like this is something that like you know, someone that age should read, like a, a child should read, or like a, a a young adult should read, an adolescent should read. Like, oh, this is like the message, right? Like, this is what I'm. This is like the sort of what I'm taking away because I've also sort of seen. Maybe I've seen like more of my friends who don't look like me. My white friends have can like turn up on teachers and like not get sent <laughs> get suspended or like i can see them shoplift or whatever like they can have like a weird they can have like a human interaction like oh i'm sorry i didn't mean to step on your shoes officer oh now i'm being putting handcuffs and coming against the wall that you know that's something that maybe miles can't do you know and also like they have a whole there's a whole organization that is their whole job is just fixing damage that superheroes do like you know like, damage Cole's whole job is just existing because you know power man through the scorpion through a brick wall or whatever so like you know, maybe he can get away with that, but like maybe necessarily Miles can't get away with that. Like Luke Cage can't, you know, body slam Fin Fang Foom or whatever through like three blocks of like Queens and like walk away from it without having some type of conversation. And like, I think Misty, as someone who has sort of walked both those worlds, she's also sort of a stand in from, from my mom. Like Misty sort of works in like law enforcement, which is a whole different ballpark of circumstance. You have to like realize, like, you have to like rationalize, like, wh- how you as like a black woman fit into this space and like she's like yeah like i've i've i'm like i'm a private detective like i've seen how these people think how they treat us and like i'm also like a superhero and i see how like even the greater world treats us and like i think you just have to come in with the plan like that's just very much what she's trying to instill in him and like that's sort of that's sort of like an, a distillation of, like what i want their relationship to be like the mentorship of it is that like you know she's definitely obviously seen a lot more than him but also she's walked through that world as a black woman who people view her infinitely different than she they view even colleen or even not even colleen even like peter or or, or gwen stacy yeah yeah and, and you mentioned before about um his teacher mr akpolo who you said was was based on uh, a teacher yeah my buddy Virginia. yeah yeah and i like the 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 fact that you know he's he's Miles shows up late to to school and mm-hmm. and he's getting in trouble and Genki's like I've never seen him so mad or what have mm-hmm. you, and Mister Akpolo is 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 getting on him, not just for being late but he talks about 
to, to Miles, it, it was the, the concept of responsibility or personal yeah. responsibility. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he's in this position, a very unique position, because he wins this lottery. You know, the very first mm -hmm. time we meet Miles Morales in, 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 in Ultimate Fallout number four, he's winning yeah. his lottery mm -hmm. to get into this, this exclusive school in Brooklyn. Yeah. You know, an opportunity that, that most other kids don't get. Uh, and Mr. Akpolo is aware of that. He, he's, he's, he's talking to him. He's like, you, you know, you won this tremendous opportunity. You squandered. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you see this, 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 this black teacher talking to this black kid in, in this exclusive school. And he's like, yeah, you won this opportunity. You're squandering it. You know, yeah. that, that was, that was a real powerful moment. Just mm -hmm. both to miles as a, as just as a young black man, but also as a superhero. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I didn't dive deep and super deep into the the his background, but I always thought like, you know, Akpolo is either like first generation or like he moved here when he was very young with his parents from like you know uh, Lagos or some like uh, another equally like large city in Nigeria, and like, yeah, he he really saw what it took to like get to where he's at, and he's probably like, yeah, you know, I've been that age, like I, I've like I've seen people squander the opportunities. I'm imagining at Brooklyn Vision Academy, he's also seen plenty of kids there squander those opportunities, and like. You know, he, he he's not coming at it with like the soft edge that maybe like Miles would like to have, but like I think ultimately that conversation is like he wants him to do better because he sees how much potential that Miles has, even though it comes off as him being a massive dick to him <laughs> in the moment. Because again, at we're that age, like we don't necessarily see the thirty thousand foot view. We just see this this sort of figure of of, of authority ripping us a new one for no reason, like because the bus was late or whatever the thing is. Like we can't sort of step outside of ourselves and see like what maybe like the the greater meaning is of this conversation we're having one of the things that you also um um did is you have this line in here about um miles as he's talking to his girlfriend tiana starling mm. and he's and he's talking about how he's worried about the people that are around him getting hurt um it, it really sounds like it was some foreshadowing there can we expect Mild to be suffering some type of major tragedy in this run. Um, you know, there's definitely be a status quo change, and that's all that I'll say. Um, um, you know, tragedies work on multi, multi there are different definitions of, and, and I think ways to showcase tragedy. Uh, but there, you know, there's going to be a shakeup, and that's that. That's all that I'll say. There will be definitely be a shakeup. Um, what can you tell us about this this new villain that uh, he has? Yeah, I'm um, Rabble. Um, I love that character a lot. Um, I think, uh, it went, so the third issue is like sort of like her origin, origin story. So like, you'll see more about her there and I obviously don't want to spoil that, but like, you know, she, 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 I think somewhat like most good villains, um, there's definitely some, some truth to what, what her grievances are and what she's, what she's, what she's facing and like how she wants to sort of write the world is where the sort of, uh, where it's sort of you're like, Oh, maybe you should fix, maybe you shouldn't do that as far as like fixing the plan. But like, I think she's very relatable, uh, particularly anyone who's had to deal with, uh, with, uh, you know, uh, with education in, in, in America or the American medical system. Like it, it's, it's uh, any opportunity, they, they, almost any opportunity that, that will turn you into a supervillain. <laughs> like, I don't care how nice you are, like dealing with medical bills or like trying to get higher education will, will definitely push you to your limits. And like, I think Ravel is definitely um, obviously a personification of that. My own thoughts when it comes to those things. Um, and I, 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 I think she's also a very capable person. I think you, I think the takeaway that you would want to take from Ravel is like, man, if given the right opportunity, she could have been uh, a Riri Williams or like a Tony Stark. Um, if she was given the certain opportunities that like other people got, um, but she wasn't. And like, you can, you will see obviously why that, why she carries that chip on her shoulder um because again back to sort of Akpolo's first conversation and the first issue is that like you know there is a privilege to miles's life whether or not he admits it or, or sort of understands it and like uh you could very easily see like how that sort of opportunity can change could change someone's whole life trajectory for them not only them but also like their family and uh, that's definitely where rabble Raneem is sort of coming from um when it comes to like what her grievances are with with miles in the system I don't, ex I don't expect you to spoil it, but I have a couple suppositions. I, I think, mm -hmm. obviously, Rabble, I think, is the girl that Miles, I personally think, girl, the, the, the girl that Miles saved in the first issue. Mm -hmm. I think Rabble's the one who did the upgrades the Bumbler got. Mm -hmm. And I think the way that you're handling Rabble, based on what you just said, 
Rabble could possibly be like Miles's version of the Prowler. Mm, mm. You know, in terms of having yeah. someone who, if if but for their set of circumstances, based on their skill set or, or yeah. brilliance, they could have gone down a different path and been a superhero. Yeah. So I don't want to comment on it. I'm just saying I'm just putting <laughs> it out there. Hopefully that happens because one of the things Miles has been criticized as having one of, one of our partners here, uh, Richard. Mm -hmm. um, says one of the things that 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 he has not liked about Miles Morales is that he's not had a a very thorough rogues gallery. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, like if you were to ask who's Miles Morales' exact nemesis, mm -hmm. it's it's kind of hard to pin it down to any particular person. So I think you have a tremendous opportunity to to define uh, a rogues gallery or at least a, a new nemesis for him that can be defined as this is this is Miles's miles's guy yeah i'm uh, excited to do it um I, I i think there's been some really fun villains that have popped up i for me for me um i've sort of referenced him a little bit vaguely in the second issue is that um the accessor to me is like one of the most terrifying right. villains that miles has ever faced and like uh Saladin absolutely broke Miles and me reading it. Like I have never felt more scared for like this like child. Well, this, he, like, he got kid. dragged. He got yeah, dragged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like I, 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 I love that. Um, I also also say like their defense is that like you know Spider Man's been around for like 60, 70 years. So like you've had you can like you know when when like you know the Vulture first dropped like man this guy's a banger. You know it's it's I think one of the sort of one of the benefits of of Miles is that like since he's such a newer character like he's only been around ten I guess it's sort of like eleven years at this point. Is that like yeah. You can sort of like start picking and make sort of build up those rogues gallery, but um, yeah, I one of the things that I that I have very conscious of is coming in is like getting him more, hopefully villains that people enjoy that will last, and I, I think Rabble is one of those. Um, uh, I think she could be a very fun nemesis, but also creating other fun nemesis nemesi for for Miles is definitely something that's on my 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 docket, my my sort of like two three year plan um, if it if it gets that far. Your storyline right now kind of reminds me of a, a twist on the Tinker storyline from mm. the PS5 Miles game. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I mean, I'm a big fan of that game. Um, big, I love that game so much. I love that particular depiction of um, of the Tinkerer. And, like, yeah, she was Finn, the character's name in that version is it's very much an influence as far as like um, adding like a villain who is Miles's age, um, who um, also. Uh, again uh without spoiling anything is you know a very intelligent person who again if given the right opportunities could probably use that to better the world and um uh yeah it was very conscious like i wanted to i definitely that was a huge design that was a huge influence not only in design but also just like character lore wise like i really wanted to see that character brought into the comics so like uh she was there's definitely in the dna of, of rabble i have a pitch <laughs> hate me Every time I do these, Derek's laughing his ass <laughs> off because he knows every time I do these interviews with creators, I always got to give my pitch. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll, I'll run the disclaimer. If you choose to run it, I won't ask for a dime. It's on the record. All right. Mm -hmm. The pitch is this. Have Miles somehow, some way, make his way down to New Orleans and Strange Academy. <laughs> have him meet Zoe Laveau and have them go on an adventure together. Mm. Um. He is at that age where hanging out with other kids, superpowered kids his age down at Strange Academy, mm -hmm. I think would be kind of cool. Because um, Miles had a, a run where he ran into the kids from um, the X-Men, uh -huh. the young X-Men, like Cyclops, G yeah. and they were The younger versions got take, taken back in, mm -hmm. in, 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 in time or moved forward in time. And he he got to hang out with him. I thought that was kind of cool for him to hang out with other kids his own age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the Strange Academy kids are just so cool. I mean, that's that's just one of the best books on on, on the market. Yeah, I think yeah he, would, he would fit. I think he would fit in well, hang out with them for a few issues. But that's just the pitch. It's a good pitch. Uh, <laughs> um, just want to let what, you know, Cody, you're getting a lot of a lot of help on on uh, on meetups. <laughs> in the chat here i'm not gonna I, I don't have enough time to show them all but you're getting a lot of help oh great yeah you're, you're, you're real pop you're yeah. real popular dude you're getting a lot, of, a lot of comments um is there any possibility we might have any interdimensional you know shenanigans in your storyline so that he can meet your boy spider punk dude i would love nothing more i would love spider nothing k more. 
I would love nothing more for him to hang out with 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 Hobart. Um, I'm definitely definitely not much multiversal stuff in this first year because I wanted to take him back to like just be hanging out in in Brooklyn. But I have said repeatedly that I would love for them to hang out one on one, not in like a giant Spider Verse save the multiverse uh, environment. So I uh, is definitely on the docket of things I would love to do if Marvel would let me do it because. Uh, truly, like those are my two favorite characters I've ever written. Like, I love the Spider Punk universe so much, and I even remember when I, when I was writing Spider Punk, is that like um, I would jokingly say how fun it would be to have Miles hang out with him for like just a week, just see what it's like living in like their crappy little like community center and hanging out with like punk rock Riri and 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 punk rock uh, Captain America. It would be such a fun world to see him like sort of navigate. Um, you had a good time writing Spider Punk. It was clearly I mean, yeah, it was great. Um, you know, it would be possible for Miles to hang out with Spider Punk if he made his way to New Orleans <laughs> and Brother yeah. Voodoo opened a portal. So, here, here's Spider UK, here's Spider yeah. Punk, and you guys can all hang out. And hilarity would ensue. Um, t- tell, tell us about your experience writing Spider Punk because you said this, he's, he's the character that's kind of near to your heart. Yeah, I mean, um... is, he, is he your favorite version of Spider Man? It's it's not counting Miles. Yes, he's definitely my favorite, um, definitely favorite version Spider not out Spider Man outside of Miles. Um, it w- it was good. It was so fun because um, it, I, I sort of took the, took the process to writing this as I do when I write like movies or, or or whatever episodes of TV and stuff. Is that like first thing I did was I just made a playlist of like punk music. Um, it was like 50, 60 songs. It was a huge playlist of like all the punk songs I listened to growing up, mixed with like new stuff and stuff I haven't heard. And then I would just like work to that, right, right to that. So I was just listening to like punk music all day, every day, writing the series. <laughs> and um, the artist that that write that that drew it, Justin, um, it's the most collaborative I've been with an artist ever. Um, we were texting constantly, DMing constantly. We all had the same influences. Like whenever we were, he was a huge fan of Dragon Ball Z and Dragon Ball Super as well as me. So uh, whenever we'd find like a cool panel, like I would say, hey, look at this panel, like Vegeta cooking someone or like, look at this panel, like Goku shooting a, a, a power. I mean, how can we work this in? He's like, yeah, do let's do it. So like it was such a fun, like geek time, like geeking out moments like that. And um, he was the first artist I've worked with where like I explicitly were like, hey, what would you like? What do you want to do? Like, what would be a fun thing for you to write? And he was like, I would like to write this, this and this. So like that last issue with like the six page splash like that was purely because he said he would like to write, like, like to draw splash panels. And I was like, you know, this is uh, a book where editorial lets us sort of get away with these sort of fun, weird things that sort of break format. Like, I think issue three, when they meet Daredevil, um, right. uh, Matea, um, they, uh, there's this there's this panel that's a secret splash double spread where like you have to turn it um, horizontally and it becomes like a, like a double spread where it's like them breaking into... A, a house and like or to like a, a hideout and uh our editor was like yeah do it that'll be fun you don't see it that offer that awkward that often and also it would be funny to see readers like in public like having to turn their comic book to read it properly so like they were like yeah you can just write the six page super splash and like they did that and um justin was great he had so much fun drawing it it was one of, it's the only book i've been on so far where every single team member would be like this is the most fun i've had coloring a thing this is the most fun i've had lettering a thing this is the most fun i've had actually drawing a thing this is the most fun i've had editing a thing so uh, i think you, that joy to, sort of came across um and also we had carte blanche to do whatever like when i first came in i was like yo um you know if any, anyone that knows anything about punk or a little bit about punk history is like traditionally like there were a lot of like black and brown punks in and in, in the scene and they were always usually sort of written out of those history books and stuff so like i the first thing i did was like yo um danny the, the editor was like hey i just want to make everyone in this book a person of color like i don't want to write another story about like white people like great cool it's like i'm also gonna make most of the villains are gonna be white dudes he's like cool he's like yep that's fine so like <laughs> and nazis too yeah nazis too so like that's why like you know i was able to like sort of like add some color to um Carl um, Morning Dew, uh, Captain Anarchy. Like, I got to make him uh, my buddy. I have a really good friend, Joey, who was Cowlitz, a part of Cowlitz Nation and uh, uh, Native American groups. So, like, I made him Cowlitz because that's, I can't think of too many um, Captain America variants that are actually like Native. Um, that's where I brought in Kamala. That's where I made Matea, um, 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 Colombian. Like, there's all that stuff. I just got to do that and they were super fun. The only thing that they said I couldn't do is that <laughs> originally I had 
all the DC cops have Punisher logos, and they're like, you can't do that. Like, that's too crazy. Yeah, I was like, okay, but uh, that's the only thing they said I can physically do. But there was a, that was besides that, they gave me complete carte blanche to write the story that we wanted to write in. Um, that would have hit too close see, to home. Yeah, they were like, no, that's we don't want to get in that that minefield. So, but I think you can sort of see that sort of joy. Um, spread across the pages, and I think that's why I think people enjoyed the book so much. Uh, Azure Beast agrees that uh, Strange Academy kids could actually come to New York oh, to the, visit the, the sanctum. sanctum in New York, and then that's how you get your portal that leads to Spider Punk and Spider uh -huh. UK. You go ahead and write this down. Uh, uh, I'm just saying. I'm not, I'm not doing a bit. I'm actually am writing I'm, this down. I'm, 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 I'm saying, just have them visit. They got to do a, a field trip sometime, right? Mm -hmm. No bus required with all those portals. <laughs> um, let's see what other what other comments we have here. Uh, some Austin Crafton asked, "Have you would you ever be interested in writing for Black Panther?" I do. I mean, I would be so nervous because Tala Hunt. I mean, it's such a it's a hard act to follow. He did such a fantastic job with with Black Panther. Um, but I, I would I would like to take a crack at at least like a mini, like a five issue thing would be fun. Um, it's it's so telling that you said what you just said, because you said it was like a little folk, I don't know if it was a faux pas, but you said mm. Tani Heisey Coates was such a hard act to follow. You didn't yeah. mention the subsequent... I don't want to talk about that. But oh. yes, <laughs> cool. Uh, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole because the rest of the lords will start yelling at me, so <laughs> I, won't, I won't do that. Um, C. Cole says, uh, have Miles visit Wakanda and just hug T'Challa and say... <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God! There's so many things I could say, but I'm not <laughs> going to. Um, uh, Ricky Tomlin asks, "Is there a meaning to the abbreviation on the gene vest?" FMS yeah, it, it has two meanings. Um, the the official meaning is "Friendly Neighborhood Spider Man," but for the team, we always said "Fucking Spider Man," the fucking Spider Man. So whichever one when you go to, but that's how we always said it on the team. Like, this is the fucking Spider Man. <laughs> and with that. And there's also oh, sorry, sorry. We're, I'm sorry we're, I forgot. We're always, oh, a dream artist, anyone. Like I've I've worked with all the amazing artists I've worked to. Um, I, I'll take any artist. Oh, shout out to your to your artist on Miles Federico. How do you oh, dude, he's name? so good. He's so good. Yeah, like uh, if I don't know if anyone here drinks, uh, take a drink. There's a drinking game I've made up where anytime you see a pigeon, take a, a or a dove, take a, a sip of your alcohol, and like you'll be completely obliterated by the end of the issue. Like he. He loves a John Wu dove moment. Was, it looks say, he's, so he does... it looks so cool when like Miles is like flipping upside down, like it just adds like a nice like depth because he has like motion blur. It's like it's one of the coolest like art, art like artists like look like signatures things that I, I've I've come across. So like uh, I, 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 I I I it's really cool. It, it, that's, he's a that's fantastic so funny. artist. That's so funny. John Wu in the interview says he puts those doves in his films right before any major action scene that it's going to be really bloody. Ah. Like he intentionally puts the. If you watch a John Woo movie, mm -hmm. you always see the doves right before a major act of violence. Ah, it's kind of like um, Scorsese in the Godfather films. If you mm -hmm. see a, if you see oranges, yeah, oranges is right before a, a scene of violence. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, ask ask him if he can work that in. Let let that be <laughs> like our, whenever you see doves, there's about to be major action. Yeah. <laughs> Let, let him know. Let him know that's the history of the doves from John Wu. I got you. All right. So, so Derek, let's go to a commercial and we'll 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 hit our our last segment here. All right. When you go to an art museum and you see pictures on the wall, what do you think? I can tell you that a picture cannot audibly speak anything. Yet you will be challenged to find something, however, that doesn't speak louder. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. And that is how I justify buying black books at times solely for their covers. Sure, I would love for the story inside to be amazing. I would love for the writing to capture my attention and hold my thoughts for ransom. Yet I have experienced a world of story in an image. I am drawn in by drawings and pulled in by paintings not having an inkling of the message communicated by the ink. For my mind has made up its own mind, and it has told me it does not care what the artist creates, 
for I, a created being, see me in the world. I see my babies, I see my ladies, I see my brothers, I see my fathers, I see my people, I see my equals, I see everything and anything and something completely different from you and you too. We see the same shapes and colors, but not the same images. Beauty is truly in the eye of the beholder, for I beheld a canvas that canvassed my heart and mind, giving me peace, giving me sadness, and giving me anger, giving me love, and giving me hope. So when I see comic books with a face like me, I see a story where half the story has yet to be told, because truly, it can't. After all, a picture is worth a thousand words. We are back with Cody Ziegler, Black Comic Lords in the building. Um, I wanted to ask you, of all the stories that you've written um, in both television and um, in comics, uh, what story or stories have you written that were most personal to you? Ooh, good question. Um, I would say probably like... I'd say definitely these last two miles issues have been the most personal, like have the most stuff like actually taken from my personal life and put in there. Like um, I, I was very close to my mom. So like uh, I I've honestly been using Rio as like a stand in for my mother who passed last year. So like oh, that whole conversation sweet. between thank you between miles and, and, and Rio and, and his dad were like just things that like I would have conversation with my mom, like always ultimately so supporting, always there for him. Always like, Hey, keep your eyes on the horizon. Like keep it locked in. Like that's how you can orient it, orient yourself. So like, that's been like emotional stuff. Like that's definitely been in, but it would come to like what has brought me the most joy, like things and joy in life has been like probably spider punk. Like those are like the two most ones. Like it's like far as how I act with like my, when my, when I was with my shithead punk friends in like high school playing like crappy punk shows, like the mm -hmm. energy of like going on tour, like that was a lot of me. Um, um, I think honestly, Miss Marvel Kamala Khan in that is a, was a lot of me in there as well. Like always like being super happy, just happy to be at the party. Like that was, that was uh, uh that was definitely a lot of the energy that i had growing up so like i think it's probably a, a tie between those two books well what what other projects do you have upcoming what what else can we expect to see from you a uh, more miles morales spider-man um i think at some point this year futurama comes out which i which i wrote on um for 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 that so i'll tell my wife hey, yeah keep your eyes peeled for those like those come out at some point uh this that comes out at some point this year and uh it was uh, again super fun writing that. Uh, a bunch of really talented writers on that, and some really fun stuff. And uh, uh, play a game and see if you can think what jokes I wrote <laughs> when you watch it. Hey, do, do me a favor. Give, give me some props from life. Say uh, shout out to Shireen. Thank you for watching my shows. I got you. Shout out to Shireen. Thank you for watching my shows. Okay, that that, that yeah. would give me some, some cool points <laughs> to life. Thank you for that. Um, this is a question that we always ask mm -hmm. um, all of our interviewees. Um, What's on your pull list? Oh, that's funny. Um, I've been getting more into like indie stuff. Funny enough, I just got this. It's a comic. It's a comic that I just bought because I thought the art was cool. It's called Pink Lemonade. Um, so I guess I just added that. Mm -hmm. And then I'm always, I mean, I just added um, um, obviously like Eve's um, Photon series. And then I'm always supporting my buddy Zeb when, when Spider-Man comes up, like those have like been my, my, my two that I've like been, been reading, reading um, because I've been, I've been, like I said, I've been diving more into like weird indie stuff lately. Um, I just got this, it's not even, it's not even like a traditional like narrative comic book, but it's called like, like a uh, Korean American cookbook or something like that. It's just like a little illustrated thing um, that's in there. So like, I've been reading like more stuff like that. And then like more like one-off short vignettes, like um, gleam by, Freddy Carrisco. I don't know if anyone's read that, but like that's um like a collection of like three vignettes, all like sort of like weird black cyberpunk stories that sort of like it's like a very loose narrative that I've been been reading like stuff along those lines. But um yeah, uh Photon and, and Amazing Spider-Man have, have been like my go-to pools. 
I'll give you three uh, indies that I think are good reads right now. That yeah, are on the, shelves. Um, the top of the list will always be Philadelphia. Oh, yeah, Warriors. yeah, yeah. Um, that and, and, and Anita Hawes. Um, there's a book that just came out last week called Mosley. Is it you recommend it? Oh, yeah, that, that was a good book. Uh, um, I enjoyed that one. There's 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 a brother who's who's been on the show a few times. Mm -hmm. um, Brian Hawkins has a book called The Vineyard, which is <clears> kind <throat> of an off the beaten path kind of horror book, mm -hmm. you know, black horror book. I, I recommend that one too. Just yeah, I'll add it to my list. I'll check those out. All right. Um, and so that's 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 our show. We though you've asked, you've answered our questions and awesome. and, and and I think you've asked, asked to answer all the questions of the people in the chat. Um, I was wondering if you would do us the honor of of, of giving the Black Comic Lords a shout out on the video. That of course. Share. Shout out to the Black Comic Lords for having me on the show and also for uh, being true believers in, the, in every completely aspect of comic books and nerd culture. I appreciate that, man. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Derek, you got anything? Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, just a few things for the chat. Um, just want to make sure everybody knows we've got a lot of good content let's get the right screen up yeah a lot of good content uh we have recurring lives uh on, on uh, odd fridays um paul and mark will do wakanda whiskey and lurdum make sure to check that out uh rich does real talk with rich on uh, some sundays and then we've got our uh, black comic lords ladies lives actually there was one yesterday which was awesome on the far sector and then, uh, you know, uh, don't just look towards our lives. You can also look at the shows we've had in the past. So you can see a list of some of these recent specials. Uh, we did an interview with um, with uh, some of the creators from Shook just this past Friday. And uh, we had the Jeffrey Thorne interview, which uh, Paul talked about as well. And also we have some great uh, uh, interviews coming up in the very near future. So just stay posted. Keep an eye on that uh, YouTube page and you'll see some more uh, placeholders pop up in the very, very near future. So just wanted to mention those things. And the last thing is, once again, so happy that we were able to cross the 1,000 subscriber threshold um, for um, for a, a, a community that is really a niche within a niche within a niche. That's a really big deal for us. So just thank you so much to um, everybody that, that comes and joins these shows. We want to make sure we give you good content. And also want to make sure that, hey, we can bring in as many uh, creators people in the industry so that we can continue to, uh, to, to show good content and uh, everybody learn a, a lot about what's going on. All right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what it, that's what it's all about. Ultimately, everyone is um, giving shine to these, these creators, particularly these black creators who, who are doing brilliant work. Um, Cody, I'm not exaggerating. When I say Cody Ziegler is, is, is the hardest uh, writer <laughs> at Marvel right now. I'm not Thank just saying you. that because he's on the show. I, I, I truly believe that um and and he needs to get he needs to get that shine he needs to get that love he's he's up there with you know your your tom taylors and your, and your chip sadarskis he just has a smaller resume and he's been he's been in the game like this this <laughs> amount of time and he's cranked out such a, a huge you know quality of of, of work already and, and he's a, he's a he's a shining star that's just, that's just he's got nowhere else to go but but further up so um um, love to have you on the show, man. We really appreciate you being here. Yeah, of course. Anytime, yeah, thank man. Thank you so nice much. Nice you. That was awesome. All right. All right. So with that, thank you all. Make sure to like, subscribe, um, and share this video, and, 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 and subscribe to the channel. And we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone. All right.